The common cold is caused by viruses that infect and affect the upper respiratory tract. In the United States, millions of people suffer from colds each year. There are many types of viruses that can cause colds. Today on Health Talk, we'll share some simple steps that you can take to prevent colds and stay healthy. So stay tuned for this important show. We're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today our topic is one that affects everybody, the common cold. Our guest is Dr. Joseph Joachim, an internist with Danarian Primary and Specialty Care. It's nice to have you back on the show, Joseph. Thank you, Eric, for having me. So important. we're talking about a really mundane, common topic, the common cold, literally a common topic. Yeah. Now tell us, I mean, as from your perspective as an internist, uh, what is a cold? What should people be doing about it? You know, a common cold uh, is the most common illness uh, in, in the country. You know, its most common cause of visits is the common cold. And it's a viral infection. And uh, the most common virus is the rhinovirus. Rhinovirus, which really means nose virus. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like it, the rhino rhinoceros. Exactly. <laughs> there's the nose virus. So it's really... Exactly. But yeah, they, and there are a whole bunch of them, aren't there? Yeah, there's, uh, there's many. The most common is the rhinovirus. But the focus is that it's a virus because that will lead us to how we are going to manage these symptoms. And I think that... that People don't realize viruses are very different than bacteria. We may yep. call them all germs, but yes. viruses, Virus. uh, tell us a little bit how, about how they're different. So, you know, like viruses, uh, uh, they are uh, illnesses much smaller than bacteria. Uh, some of them can cause chronic diseases. Some of them cause uh, acute diseases like the common cold. And uh, in this case, the management is supportive. If this was a bacteria, you know, like if it's bacterial sinusitis or bacterial bronchitis, that's a bacteria we need to treat with antibiotics mm -hmm. because antibiotics treat bacteria. But for viruses, it's usually a short-term uh, illness and uh, supportive measures, and uh, it should go uh, away by itself. Yeah, and we have some drugs that treat certain viruses like hepatitis C yeah. and HIV, yeah. but but. As you say, there were really no drugs that effectively treat a cold. No, they, they did some studies and uh, antivirals, you know, like in case of hepatitis C, you give them some antivirus and now it's curable. But for the common cold, they did studies to compare, you know, just supportive measures versus treatment with an antiviral. And there was really no advantage in giving the antivirals. So if it's the common cold, and then now we'll talk how we differentiate if it's common cold or it could be a flu or if it's bronchitis, we'll talk a little bit about this. But if it's, we really think that it's a viral common cold, Supportive measures uh, will be options. So, you know, like the most common symptoms of, uh, of common cold, we all know them. Some sneezing, low grade fever, usually less than 101. Uh, it can cause some nasal congestion. Cough, that's most of the time is, uh, is dry, uh, as, as dry cough, but sometimes it can be a little bit, uh, bit productive, but I don't expect any green or, mm -hmm. like usually like it's clear mucus. And it can cause some, uh, some, you know, like uh, malaise, like general, uh, yes, general you know. fatigue. And runny nose. And runny nose. Most of the people have it for 10 days, uh, but sometimes it can last uh, longer. Uh, cough, per se, can last up to four weeks after the, after the, the common call. And, and you said uh, a lot of people, when they have those symptoms, think it's the flu. And I want to, at some point, yeah. talk about the difference between the flu and, and the common call. But also, uh, why not take antibiotics? You know, just in case it's bacteria. We know that that's not good. Uh, Tell no. us why. You know, like uh, antibiotics are, are very effective medications for bacterial infection per se, but no medication comes with no side effects. So uh, we have to think about side effects. Some, uh, some common antibiotics can cause severe diarrhea. Some antibiotics can cause uh, tendon pain, joint pain. And then we are always worried about uh, getting bacterial resistance, which means that if we have a bacteria, we need antibiotic that works for that bacteria. If we keep on using antibiotics, uh, the bacteria will, de will develop resistance. So you give this antibiotic, it will not work anymore. And then... Uh, when you really need them. Yes, exactly. So now you're in a tough spot. So that's why if there is no benefits from taking the antibiotics, you should avoid them. Right. They should not and be again, prescribed. They will not help. And then people say, well, I had a cold, and they gave me uh, azithromycin, and I got better. But, but that's just the cold better. getting better. Exactly. It will get better either way. In 10 days, it will get better. So uh, see your doctor. Let them do the exam. 
if it does not sound like bronchitis or pneumonia and there is no symptoms of, uh, of the flu, just give it some time and we'll talk about the treatment. For example, for if you have the runny nose or congestions, you can take some, uh, some decongestions. They come in topical, nasal sprays, or oral decongestions. Sometimes they come in combination with allergy medication. They help for the congestion. For the, for, you know, like if you're having the fatigue, the malaise, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can be helpful. Yeah. That's like Advil or Advil, the buprofen or whatever. Advil or naproxen or whatever you have at home. Follow the dose on the bottle and you'll be fine. And then uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol. This is another thing that can help with the, with the malaise. Uh, some alternative medication, some alternative treatment can be helpful. For example, for the cough, honey can be helpful. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, honey. And, and I think when we're talking, a lot of the over-the-counter over -counter medicines can be, can be very helpful in partially relieving your symptoms. I think, though, there, there's a lot of opportunity to spend too much money on those. I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> read the labels. I actually have a, a website where I've, I've listed the common ingredients that are available over the counter, and uh, I think it's DrEricNazer.com. People may want to go look at that because it will tell you what you can buy generically for congestion, for the runny nose, um. for the fever, uh, and, and you can buy these generically, mix and match them as your symptoms dictate, and not buy these expensive branded concoctions. And you, know, you have to be careful because like a lot of times, like over-the-counter medication have the same component as others. So some of them have something like similar to non steroidal anti-inflammatory, some of them has aspirin, some of them has acetaminophen. And you know, there's regular doses you should not exceed. So talk to your doctor, just ask them, yeah. call to this website, I think it will be very helpful. You know, was, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Sorry, no, they did some, uh, they did studies and they checked the anti mm -hmm. That's for anti, for, for coughing. For the cough, and uh, they, they, they were not, they compared them to placebo and they were not really helpful. They don't really work. So no. there's a lot of stuff about cough. There's not a lot of good me medicines. I mean, yeah. people, glycerol glycolate, I guess, guanfacin is the one that's available over the counter. Yeah. But it's not clearly, it's, it's not, not clear it's that not, it really yeah. works. What, 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 there's a little bit of evidence, as, as I said, like honey. Again, like if you don't have diabetes, you can take honey. And uh, you be careful if for kids less than one year, they should not take honey. But anyone else, taking some honey at night can be helpful for the cough. There's some nasal spray, like uh, uh, anticholinergic, for example, like Atrovent. Mm -hmm. You can, like nasal spray for four days only. Because mm -hmm. uh, anything you get a rebound that, with yes, some of that exactly, stuff. Cause me. So four days only, it can be helpful with the cough. And the biggest treatment for the cough for the common cold would be time. Give it some time. Give it 10 days. Give it a couple of weeks. It will go away. It will get better. And then we guarantee that it will. <laughs> but yeah. let's talk about the flu, because the yeah. uh, flu, flu is a, a very different story. It's a very specific illness. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. So for example, flu, again, is another virus. Uh, and uh, it presents much more aggressive than the common cold. So you know, like common cold starts gradually. Like you start one day, you feel a little bit like you're fatigued. A next morning, yeah, in your throat. In the throat. Usually, like flu, most of the time, it presents uh, aggressive, like high-grade fever. Chills, chills, which means like you have fever and then it's uh, it's breaking, uh, and then the, the fatigue is usually like like much much different than mm -hmm. uh, than uh, than the cold. Like we've all had the colds, and we should we should be our our uh, you know like our health advocates. We know how the cold feels. If it feels anything different, talk to your doctor because we should check for the flu within the first three days and start the antivirals mm -hmm. because for the flu antivirals actually uh, can be helpful. And, can, sure. and uh, of course, something now, I know the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, is recommending flu shots for everybody. Oh, I would definitely So, So that. this is, I mean, they're, they're not 100% effective, but I think flu, as opposed to the common cold, influenza can be fatal, yes. especially for the older population, people with chronic diseases. Uh, no. And, and so it's not a disease you want to fool around with. No. So maybe you could say a few words about that, but like, I feel so strongly that people don't understand that the flu is a real, separate, potentially dangerous illness that, you want, that we want to yeah. prevent in the young people, pregnant women, in the elderly, and we should all be getting a I flu shot. Like, and all the informations uh, are available for anyone who search for them. Flu can be a fatal disease, especially in people with uh, like smokers, people with uh, COPD, with diabetes, uh, the elderly and the young. Uh, this uh, viral infection can be a portal for more serious life-threatening mm -hmm. infection. It can lead to pneumonia, hospitalization, death. And I remember during internship, a young 35-year-old man, he was a young guy with diabetes I who got the flu, and he died uh, in all, the hospital we all know, have, with maximum medical care. We all, we've all seen these cases, you know? And then, uh, and then 
we've all seen these cases. It changed the way we practice medicine. We have someone young, healthy, with the flu in the ICU uh, on life-sustaining uh, uh, measures. Um, but the thing is, you can't prevent it. They ask me, like, yeah, but like it's 100 percent. I know it's not 100 percent. You know, it's not 100 percent guaranteed for prevention, but it significantly decreases the risk of getting the flu. The side effects are really negligible. Like, like for me, I've been practicing for 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 several years now. I did not see a case of significant complication from the flu vaccine, and I give them quite. No, yeah, quite they, it aches, and maybe you get a little bit of a, a fever the next day, like but, not, not but it's nothing. Not, not, nothing, nothing yeah, compared no, to getting the flu. I, I can't stress that, yeah. uh, stress that enough. Get the, get your flu shot, and then if you think you've got the flu, see your doctor because there are doctor, medicines you have that can three be days. useful. If it's more aggressive than a common cold, it's not something that you used to have. Call your doctor. We're, you know that's why we're there. Which we, it's very very quick screening for the flu, and uh, if it's positive, we can always start an antiviral, which can help. Uh, Remember, the flu has has the fever, the muscle aches and pains, headache, usually cough. It's a tracheal bronchitis, so it infects the yes, upper airway. Good. Usually yeah. a cough, yeah. uh, and usually not much of a runny nose, and. Mm. Yeah. Maybe say like, people always talk about the stomach flu. I, the, the, there, there really is no stomach flu. Influenza is uh, influenza. Yeah, influenza. Yeah, you know, like some of them, like you know, there's uh, some influenza like type B can present with some uh, with some uh, diarrhea. You know, uh, if you're having these symptoms and you're not sure if it's stomach flu or it's the flu, just talk to your doctor. Let them check yeah. for it. You know, like uh, be, be proactive. And again, like it's much more aggressive than the common cold. Common cold starts slowly. This one, like. Sometimes right. it hits you like a truck, you know, like it's very right. it's You are very, sick. Yes, you You're are, you are sick. sick. Just, talk, uh, just talk to your doctor. And you know, there are, other, there are other, you know, like sometimes like bronchitis, for example, which can be a uh, bacteria. Usually the, for cold, we said that it goes away in 10 days. If it's lingering more than 10 days or you have uh, some wheezing or you have some green discharge from the, you know, like the green discharge, the green nasal mm -hmm. discharge, it can, be, uh, it can be sinusitis for mm -hmm. that too. So. Uh, uh, and sometimes I know colds can leave you with some uh, residual bronchospasm, which is yes, twitchiness to your yes. and cough may continue for several weeks. There are things we can do about that. There are some. Just talk to your doctor. Let them examine you. Let, let them listen to your lungs. See if you have some wheezing. If you need anything to open these uh, these bronchioles. Okay, we, it's case by we case. We have less than a minute left. Do you want to say a couple of things about preventing the spread of colds? I would say the best way to manage cold is prevent it. Prevent it by washing. Avoid sick people. Wash your hands. Keep hand sanitizer on uh, on you. Uh, if it's a common cold, give it some time. Please don't use antibiotics because the the, the, the risk outweighs the, the benefits. If it's common cold, 10 days you feel, feel better. The cough will be better in a couple of weeks. And I can't stress enough, washing your hands really does help prevent spread. As well, as we inoculate ourselves. A lot of people don't realize it. You get it on your hands, you touch your mouth, you touch yeah, your you eyes, and you do that you all can, the time. You can give it to your friends, loved ones. And hand sanitizers were great, and then they're available everywhere. Maybe say one other thing: if you're going to sneeze, sneeze into your arms. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, you know, <laughs> yeah. So we can prevent spreading them. There's a lot of good information there. I hope people yeah. listen to it all or rerun this part on your VCR. Actually, I'm, I'm dating myself. Rerun it on your uh, on your digital machine. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Joseph Joaquin, for joining me on Health Talk today, and thank you for watching. Please remember to share your questions and comments with us. Just call Community Relations at New Vance Health at 203-852-2250. Well, Thomas, you've got pre-diabetes, but with more exercise and a change in diet, it can be reversed. I've tried exercising. It, it just makes me hungry for bacon. I love bacon, too. And who really likes to exercise? Not me. <laughs> me neither. Nobody. I... <laughs> <laughs> so we're good? What? Oh, you still have pre-diabetes. Big time. When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball every chance I could. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment.
and that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke. F-A-S-T. Fast. A urinary tract infection, often referred to as a UTI, is an infection in your lower urinary system. It is more common in women than in men. On this week's Health Talk, we're going to discuss the symptoms, causes, and treatments of UTIs, as well as what you need to do in health to help prevent them. So stay tuned, we're up next. Hello, I'm Dr. Eric Mazur. Today we will discuss urinary tract infections or UTIs. Joining me is Dr. Joseph Joaquin. He's an internist with Darien Primary and Specialty Care. Welcome back to Health Talk. Joseph. Thank you for having me, Eric. UTIs, urinary tract infections, very, very common. What's, let's first talk about a little anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> what is the urinary tract or the urinary so, system? Urinary tract, we start with the kidneys. Kidneys are usually located behind the flanks, on, uh, be the, uh, behind the flanks, on, uh, behind the, the the chest wall, mm -hmm. and then you have the ureters that goes all the way from the from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. And the ureters are simply living tubes that drain mm -hmm. the urine from the mm -hmm. kidney into the bladder. Yes, and, and the bladder is a holding tank. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then the outlet is the urethra. The urethra and. The urethra in women is Shorter pretty short, that's whereas that in the man is very long. Yeah. It's where the urine comes out. Yes, yeah, so that's why women tend to have more urinary tract infection. So it's easier for the bacteria to get their yes, way back through this. Yes, they're short distance from the, from, uh, you know, from, from the anus to the urethra compared to, uh, to men. So women are at higher risk of getting urinary tract infection because of uh, anatomy. And you mentioned the anus. Why did you mention the relationship of the anus to the urethra? Because the most common, co the most common bacteria that cause urinary tract infection are, are E. coli. E. e. coli are really present in the fecal material, so that's why, uh, you know, and th that's why shorter urethra, short, you know, there's easier access to, uh, to bacteria. And that's why, you know, like way cleaning ourselves, wiping is very important, so it should always be from, uh, fr from the front to the back. But the, so you're wiping the bacteria away from, from the urethra, the urethra then towards the urethra. Now that's not true for men, is it, or is it? No, no. I, you know, it's usually different for men, but usually for women. But women. So this is one thing that a woman can do to help prevent getting a urinary infection is always to wipe from the front to the back, yeah. so that they're wiping the bacteria away, away from, from the, the urethra. urethra. Exactly. You know, for men they don't have this problem, but uh, you know, like uh, we see urinary tract infection in men with enlarged prostate. So men, because of the anatomy, the prostate, it's an, it obstructs the track of the urine, so there's, uh, there's more uh, bladder remains in the, in, uh, more urine remains in the bladder, and then with any stagnant urine or body fluids. Yeah, that, that's, that's the important point, and you just said that anytime you have stagnant body fluids, they tend to get infected. If it's in your lungs, yes. in your sinuses, in your urinary urinary. The exactly. prostate, people, they, they hear a lot about it on TV because yeah. of the supplement, <laughs> it's but it's, it's sort of a walnut-shaped gland that sits right at the exit of your bladder uh, and surrounds your urethra. urethra. Yeah, so so it's, it's really, you know, so it's not it's related to the urine, but it can obstruct it yeah, if it gets like large. If it's enlarged, it, it presses on the urethra, and then you have like a, you think about like a, like a kinked, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so, so how does someone know they have a urinary infection? You know, the symptoms of urinary infection can be increased in urination, like you're going much more to the bathroom, uh, burning sensation on urination, uh, urgency, urgency which is, you know, you feel the urge that you need to urinate, but you don't have enough time uh, to make it to the bathroom, so there might be some urine loss. And then um, uh, pressure, some people they just present as, uh, as a pressure sensation in the pelvic area, which can be from you know, the urinary tract infection. And the bladder sits sort of right above the pelvic bone, right here. Yes, yeah. in, your, in your, actually in your pelvis, not in your abdomen, technically. Exactly, so, so that's why, like a pressure sensation, sometimes can be from urinary tract infection. And for our elderly, they might not even have these symptoms. Uh, elderly, you know, which are the, you know, all of them are at high risk of getting urinary tract infection, and the presentation is different. So they might not even have any of the symptoms that we discussed. It might just present as change in mental state, especially for people with uh, some memory impairment. 
urinary tract infection can present. They're just not acting themselves. They are more withdrawn or more aggressive. Or how about fever? How common is fever with urinary tract infection? So, as I said, urinary tract infection is all about anatomy. So, if it's in the bladder, I don't expect a lot of fevers. But if you're having fevers, chills, and pain at the flanks behind the behind the chest wall, just uh, keep an eye. Like it, it can be like a infection, urinary tract infection, but inside the the, the kidney. Yeah. So this means the bacteria have gotten beyond the bladder up those from tubes. From the urethra, bladder, through the, through the ureters. And that could be a more serious infection. Yes, it can, sp it can seep to the blood and uh, it can be a life-threatening event. So urinary tract infection with flank pain, fever and chills, nausea and vomiting, talk to your doctor, Under you can have infection inside the... Uh, yeah, and, inside. and to explain the, the bladder symptoms, if it's just the bladder and the urethra, uh, the bladder gets irritated by this infection yeah. and it gets a little twitchy, just yes. like... So that's why you can't hold a lot of urine in it because it doesn't want to get expanded. Yeah. Uh, as you said, there's the urgency, there's a sense of burning as the urine travels through the urethra. So all these symptoms you can sort of predict based yeah. upon what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And uh, treatments? Treatment, uh, if it's urinary tract infection, uh, antibiotics, okay? So antibiotics work uh, on bacteria and urinary tract infection most of the times are bacterial uh, infection. Uh, sometimes we can, uh, you know, like when I, if someone calls me and, and say, hey doc, like I have uh, these urinary symptoms, I usually ask them to, uh, ask to come to clinic. We'll take the urine, we'll, we'll do a dip to see if there's any signs in the urine that there's an active infection. If there's an active infection and signs of infection, we might, we might treat before we have the result of the mm -hmm. culture. And we send the urine to the culture to make sure that the antibiotics we chose works on the germ. Do you always have. culture the urine when, you, when someone is? I always, I always culture. So that way you know, you will know what you were treating. Yes, we know the sensitivities, make sure that the antibiotics we're using is, uh, is effective. But sometimes I start antibiotics before I have the result mm -hmm. of the culture, you know, if they're having enough symptoms. And usually if you're having symptoms of urine tract infection, most likely, it's one of those things that people actually, if they tell me they have urine tract infection, they had in the past, so most likely they do have the infection. I take a culture, start some antibiotics, and see if it's sensitive. Now, I know that there's some recent uh, literature, and I've been seeing it come up in the medical journals, about the overtreatment of urinary infections. Do you want to say a couple of yeah. words about that? You know, uh, we say urinary, urinary tract infections are usually uh, symptomatic. If they are not symptomatic, if you're not having any symptoms, and for one reason or another we did a urine culture, let's say during, uh, sometimes during a physical or during, uh, you're presenting for something else with your, your infection, not all bacteria in the bladder is infection. Sometimes, you know how we have bacteria on the skin? They say it's more, uh, more common than the skin cells. So sometimes we have bacteria that lives, uh, that lives in, in the bladder without being an infection. So if that's the case, treating or not treating will not, will not do any difference. And overusing of antibiotics can develop. Which is becoming a big issue now. Big issue, yes. We start to have uh, resistance. So we ha you have some, uh, some people with bacteria that's not responsive to uh, to any of the antibiotics that we have, at least the oral, so they might have to go to the hospital. And there are a few cases that even the IV antibiotics in the hospital cannot treat this infection. So antibiotics, use as little as possible, uh, and you have to make sure that you need them. Do you want to say a few words uh, about preventing urinary infections? As I said, uh, urinary tract infection, uh, the risk fact, you know, uh, most common cause of infection comes from the fecal material. So as, as we mentioned earlier, wiping from the front to the back for a woman. For, uh, and then if you could don't hold the urine. Every time you have, uh, you have uh, urine stagnant in the, in the bladder, there's a high risk of infection. So if you feel the urge, just go to the bathroom. We see it a lot in, in kids. Sometimes they don't want to urinate in school, so they keep on holding it. And this is a risk factor for urinary infection. So don't hold urine. Drink plenty amount of water. Stay hydrated. Uh, and then for men, make sure that prostates are, you know, mm -hmm. the prostates are not enlarged and it's not obstructing the, the urinary, uh, urinary tract no, and hygiene. And hygiene. Uh, I've also heard some people say drinking fruit juice like cranberry juice or acidic juice helps acidify yeah. the urine. Does that, does that help at all? You know, there's no real, there's no real evidence. So what I usually say, uh, if you're going to use, uh, let's say, cranberry juice, which is one of the most common, uh, make sure you don't have diabetes because these uh, they can have a lot, lot of, of sugar, sugar yeah. lot of sugar, and then uh, I'll ask them if they already use it or if it worked for them in the past. They can continue doing it, but I would not recommend it as a new mm -hmm. preventative way of uh, fear and infection because there's no real strong evidence uh, behind it. But you know, like sometimes uh, for preventing urinary tract infection, 
Uh, urinary tract infection can be associated with sexual inter intercourse, so uh, make sure you urinate before and uh, after the sexual intercourse. This way, there's no passage of bacteria from the yeah. urethra to the bladder. No, it's very it, it seems rather mundane, but it's pretty mechanical that you, during sexual activity, you can disrupt that area around the urethra, literally push bacteria up into that area and, uh, and seed the bladder. I know there's a, there's a term called uh, honeymoon cystitis, you know, because, like, uh, because of intercourse without, uh, you know, without uh, urination before, and then you, know, you have a high risk of getting urethric infection during honeymoon. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, so some people have women particularly will have just one urinary tract after infection after another. Uh, what can they do? The preventive antibiotics? I know that that's there, been tried in some yeah. cases. You know, uh, for one reason or another, some women, uh, yeah, they can get uh, repeated urinary tract infection, usually like, af like after childbirth or the, or the urethra is not, uh, you know, there's an access, like there's more like an open system, like some, some of the urinary tract is not uh, occluding as they're supposed to. Uh, and then the treatment would be, you know, sometimes you need to be on chronic antibiotic uh, treatment. We try to avoid it, but uh, for some cases, if they get several uh, repeat urinary tract infection, they might need to, to be on antibiotics mm -hmm. for chronic, uh, for chronic. And treatment. I know very rarely there could be some problem with the bowel where there's a connection between the colon and the, the bladder. And yeah. That's, that's a, a totally different story. Yeah, so like some, you know, like if someone has some inflammatory problems in the bowels, yeah, like, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, they can have a connection between between the the colon and the bladder. But usually, like they see some fecaloid material inside mm -hmm. the urine, uh, more more frequent. But that's a whole different. Right, it's a different organism. Yeah, even like sometimes it, air, which would be yes, air, yeah, you know, is air, a problem. like air bubbles, fecaloid material, uh, foul uh, foul smell. But the, uh, I, I, they need doctor. And how about men? You know, again, most urinary infections that we see are in women. If you start to see a man with a recurrent urinary infections, what do you think about? So, uh, uh, prostate. If I see a man with repeated urinary tract infection, I would think about the prostate. Sometimes uh, the prostate, as you said, like it's, uh, it has a capsule. And uh, if someone has a urinary tract, like you check the urine, and then they have bacteria, it can either be from the bladder or it can be infection inside the prostate that we call prostatitis. So if that's the case, you need a longer course of antibiotics. You need like 21 days of antibiotics because the prostate has a capsule. You need to give enough and for enough dose and for long enough in order for the antibiotics to, to go through the capsule and then treat the prostate infection. Otherwise, you treat for one week, the symptoms will come back uh, after you stop the antibiotics. So, so men are a different story. Yes, largely, different anatomy. They really story. shouldn't be getting bladder infections very commonly. Yeah, but if they start having bladder infections, then you have to search, like, why are they having bladder infection? Is the prostate enlarged? Is, is there an infected kidney stone? What's, what, why? They should, like, men... We've got less than a minute left. Do you want to say a couple words about chlamydia and burning when, the, when, when someone urinates for, for men and women? Oh, well, okay. Chlamydia. Chlamydial yeah. infection, the SD, the... Uh, the SD, like, for prostatitis? No, not for... for that, uh, that people can have burning uh, that may not be a urinary infection, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. it may be okay. just okay, a okay. urethritis yeah, yeah. due okay. to the, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. the chlamydia. Okay. okay. But, uh, so, so you do want to check with your doctor so that they, they can make the right diagnosis. Yes. Um, any final advice you want to give to women about preventing this? Because it's pretty uncomfortable. If you're having any urine, uh, any urine symptoms, uh, whether it's burning sensation or, or frequent urination or urgency, Talk to your doctor, let them send some, uh, some uh, urine culture, let them do the proper treatment, because not all the burning sensations are from, uh, are from urinary infections. Sometimes STDs, for example, uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia, they can present similar to UTIs, and you definitely need to diagnose these, because like, the consequences can be detrimental. Right, so you want to make the right diagnosis so you get the right treatment. Yes. And that's, exactly. a, I think, a, a good end for Nodon. We've run out of time. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Joseph Joachim, for joining me on Health Talk today. And thank you for watching. Remember to share your comments with us by calling Community Relations at Nuvance Health. That's 203-852-2250. I'll see you next time. I'm Paul George, and I want you to learn the signs of a stroke fast. F-A-S-T. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Because the sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in their recovery. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke. F-A-S-T, fast.